Hello. Thanks, Miriam. So this is our latest installation of Revolutionizing Activism, where we have people come and talk about ideas around how to make activism more exciting, more engaging. And this one is especially close to my heart because it's about humor and using humor, especially in when times are dire. So it all, it's always appropriate. It's always a, a good time. And we've got some really great panelists from different parts of the world. So I'm excited. I'm going to introduce Katie. Katie, we've talked to and consulted with over the years. She's an award-winning documentary producer, a scholar, a professor, and a strategist that works where social change, communication, documentary, and entertainment storytelling kind of come together. She is the executive director of the Center for Media and Social Impact, and she also co-founded and co-directs the Yes and Laughter Lab, which is an in incubation lab and training program for diverse comedians who create brilliant comedy on social justice topics. Her book about the role of mediated comedy and social change is called A Comedian and Activist Walk Into a Bar, The Serious Role of Comedy and Social Justice. So she knows what she's talking about. It's co-authored with Lauren Feldman and published by University of California Press. And her documentary book, Story Movements, How Documentaries Empower People and Inspire Social Change was published by Oxford University Press. And I'm very tempted just to like talk about all the great work that you do and how you get comics together with social movements and make th make messaging that's like on point, but also funny. But I know you're going to do that and you can do it better than I can. So Katie, thank you for joining us. I'm glad to have you. Thanks, Steve. Uh, hi, everyone. Hello, internet. <laughs> uh, very happy to join you all. And I'm a big, huge fan of the Center for Artistic Activism. I feel like it's a it's a sister center to the organization that I run, the Center for Media and Social Impact. So a lot of mutual admiration. I'm really excited to be here with two awesome, very funny panelists. I'm going to get started with us. Here's how this is going to go. For those of you who are uh, both creative thinkers and linear thinkers, I'm going to give you both. So here's how this session is going to go. I'm going to introduce Lola and Ricardo properly with their full biographies. And then I'm going to kick us off with a little bit of a nerdy time to talk about the research and science that I've done and synthesized from others about why it is that comedy is so meaningful when we think about social justice and social change and human rights and resilience and, and all the things that we're going to talk about today. So before I do that, I would like to formally introduce uh, the, our two panelists today. So I'm going to start with Ricardo. Uh, Ricardo Del Buffalo. I can't see you, Ricardo, because I'm because I'm reading your bio. I hope you waved. Go I'm ahead here. and wave. I'm here. You I'm waved. Here. By process of a let. There's Ricardo. You can read his name. So Ricardo Del Buffalo is a Venezuelan comedian and script writer with a background in journalism. He's starred in stand-up comedy shows and has performed in several cities in Venezuela, Colombia, Panama, Chile, and Argentina, also the United States. He's been a scriptwriter for a radio, television, podcasts, and web shows. He's hosted his own podcast and web show and has two musical albums of political and social satire. So he's also a musician. That is a lot of talent in one human. He's a human rights activist, teacher of creative writing and humor workshops, and professor of the first stand-up comedy diploma certified by a university in Latin America. So welcome, Ricardo. What a joke. Hi, thank Hello. you. Thank you very much for that. Uh, I forgot about the singing. Perhaps you will break into song later. We will see. No, because you... I sing out of, out of tune. That's my only lack of talent. I, I, I know how to play guitar, but don't know how to sing. But you know what the good news is, as a comedy person, no one notices. They don't care. Oh. And our other panelists, hello, Lola. Lola Yuksimovich has over 20 years of experience in cultural policy. She's the strategic manner at the manager at the Center for Cultural Decontamination, a nonprofit cultural institution that focuses on critical thinking and cultural and artistic production. She is also a co-founder of the Borderline Offensive, such a great name, uh, a platform for artistic research and art-based societal development, exploring issues of migration, intercultural conflict and dialogue, collective identity building, and community cohesion in contemporary Europe through art. 
Through her work, Lola believes that cultural innovation and creativity can help set new standards in public policy and societal development. I totally agree with that. Welcome, Lola. Well, thank you. you know, as would the firing squad say, we aim to please. Oh my God, I love it. We need a, we need a laugh track. We should have asked the Center for Artistic Activism for a cheesy laugh track for all our jokes. Okay, so before I get started, I'm going to tell you all a little bit uh, about myself and, and my work, a little bit of nerdy time. Oh, I see that Herbert has already put Z's in the chat for nerdy time. Don't worry, we're going to make it fun. Some, some fun insights that I was just talking about before the rest of you joined with my fellow panelists. I have another book coming out in January because apparently I cannot stop writing about this topic. The book that's coming out in January 2023 is from NYU Press. And it's called The Revolution Will Be Hilarious, Comedy for Social Change and Civic Power. And part of what I did in that book was to write about how comedy has been used around the world historically and in the present day, not just through media formats, but through forms of protest in times of dissent against authoritarian or semi-authoritarian uh, regimes and how that has happened. And so I sort of went back to the manuscript of that book today and I reminded myself of some of the fun things that I wrote about that, uh, you know, when you're writing a little bit of selective history you and, and, and you're funny or want to be funny, you kind of write about the things that make you laugh the most. So here's a fun fact that you will probably all remember is that this idea of comedic descent goes way back. We can find it across many, many cultures, but just a couple of fun facts for you, historical and present day, is uh, in ancient Rome, for example, apparently Caesar was had many, many rumored infidelities. And the way that the citizens of ancient Rome would sort of show their displeasure is by drawing phalluses all over ancient Rome. So what's funny about that, obviously, is that we are all 15-year-old boys forever in every culture, never gets old. And then in the contemporary day, the BBC has written about the massive explosion of comedy in contemporary Iraq in light of, you know, many years of conflict. And one of my favorite examples is in the face of uh, right-wing right -wing extremism in parts of Europe, one organization sent in a literal clown brigade as part of sort of the protest. And what happened in the, in the face of uh, the sort of right-wing protest was what happened was nothing happened because the clowns were so absurd that it kind of took the energy out of the hate and it kind of dissipated. Now, I am not endorsing this. It sounds a little bit dangerous to me. I'm not saying I know anything about how that activism happened, but I am saying that the image of clowns in full outfits showing up to a hate rally is so funny and ridiculously deviant to me. Um, so I thought I would just start us off with that. So I'm gonna go ahead, if, if, if everyone wants to do a little bit of nerdy stuff too, first for about five minutes, I'm going to share my screen with you all and just nerd out just for a little bit of time before I hand it over to Ricardo. So you will forgive me in advance for maybe not 100% getting this right, right away, because sharing screens is a whole thing. Okay. Okay. You all are now seeing my terribly hideous screen. Okay. Everybody can see the beginning of my slide. Yes. Okay, so here we are using humor when things are dire. I wanna tell you a few stories. Of course, I am promoting my books because most of what I say is in one of these books. And so if you wanna hear a deeper expression of them, this is the one that's out. Here's the one that's coming out in January. So I wanna tell you uh, a story. I'm gonna tell you a couple of stories and a couple of facts, I'm timing myself. This is one of my favorite examples here in the United States of using comedy to actually, in this case, bring about pretty revolutionary legislation. So this is hopefully to you all an obviously absurd looking cast of people. So this is a video called Even Supervillains Think Our Sexual Assault Laws Are Insane, talking about us in the United States. And this is the story of an activist named Amanda Wen. You can see her on the slide here on the left. Amanda Wen was a survivor of sexual assault herself. And when she basically went in search of justice for her own case, she ran into many, many loopholes in the criminal justice system in the United States. The, for example, medical evidence, 
very hard for survivors to access after a certain period of time. It can be expensive, makes it very difficult to seek justice. And so she created a, a very earnest, serious advocacy campaign working on Capitol Hill in the United States, trying to pass a law. And so she had this legislation called the Sexual Assault Survivors Bill of Rights. And as she was trying to get this done with other advocacy groups joining forces with her, it was an election year in the United States. So in election years in the United States, sometimes legislation stalls out because everybody is busy trying to get reelected. And so this, this legislation kind of stalled and it looks like it wasn't gonna go anywhere. So she joined forces with Funny or Die, uh, a sort of crew, a production organization that creates short form videos um, created by two famous comedians here in the United States. And they created this wacky video that basically is a, a satire and a parody on the difficulties in the criminal justice system. Okay, so you probably know where this story is going because we're celebrating comedy here today. So what happens is that she really credits the comedy piece. She released this outrageous piece about, you know, the absurd loopholes in the criminal justice system. The comedy attracts all kinds of attention with legislators and their staffers. The, the Sexual Assault Survivors Bill of Rights is sort of unlocked and starts moving again, and it is signed into federal law by President Obama in 2016. And this is the first ever legislation like this. So I wanna be careful here so that those of you all who are uh, my fellow nerds in the audience, I'm not claiming that this was a slam dunk sort of causal effect. It's not only comedy that matters, but I am saying that sometimes too often, if you ask me, we dismiss the powerful role of comedy in pointing out grotesque absurdities and helping us do what I like to call the sort of common sense of helping us to understand how something can be changed. So that's one of my favorite examples. And this is one of my favorite quotes. The role of the artist is to make the revolution irresistible. That is true. So participatory culture is kind of the backdrop of all of this work. And I know that the Center for Artistic Activism agrees in this very much and has a lot of writing in this regard. But here's why comedy matters so much to us now. It's comedy has always been important. The, the original definition of comedy comes from Aristotle. So this is not, we, we, you know, humor exists in all cultures, all histories used as a governance strategy for resilience, for catharsis, for critique, all of those things. But participatory culture is what's really meaningful here because we are in an era where the, the radical change in media systems and in activism Activism must be creative if we hope to engage anyone in humanitarian issues, right? And so part of how comedy works for social change and civic power, this is a lot of the research that I have done and is reflected in these books. Basically, this is a synthesis of something like 300 studies across disciplines, including my own original research about comedy as a force of influence for us as audiences and as cultural influence. And I wanted to boil this all down for you all just so you have some um, sort of brief takeaways. So comedy, when we think of comedy for so, as social influence, when it comes to civic and social and public health and human rights issues, here's how comedy actually affects us in our, in our brains and affective and cognitive minds. So comedy, of course, provides entry into taboo topics. Sometimes it's nearly impossible to talk about things unless we use comedy. Hope and optimism as motivating emotions in terms of shifting our attitudes and compelling us to act. Hope and optimism are known forces, known emotional responses that actually motivate us in those ways. Gateway to serious information over time. This is possibly one of my favorite effects of comedy because when we think about ways to engage people, sometimes those of us in the sort of serious smarty pants do-gooder sectors, it's probably a lot of you in this Zoom, we think about journalism and fact sheets and press releases and serious form and uh, white papers. Yes, we need all of those things. But there's also research that shows when we experience serious issues through comedy, we attend to those issues more seriously and more attentively over time, possibly because of this sort of common sense idea. Comedy has a memorable sleeper effect. When we learn things and learn about things, including complex and difficult things through comedy, we tend to remember it more deeply over time. 
and were persuaded by comedy through entertainment value and powerful emotions. So I wanna jump ahead to something really quickly and then I will pass it over to Ricardo. So if you were listening closely, you're thinking to yourselves as critical listeners, but it's not all about how audiences experience comedy and that's true. It's not all about uh, us watching comedy and feeling a certain way and doing something. That's a kind of magic bullet. That's not exactly how all forms of culture affect us. There's, we sort of live and swim in a whole cultural ocean that brings us lots of symbols and forms of information. So when we think about comedy and its power in social change, we're also talking about its cultural power. How does comedy build civic power when we're talking about organizations and leaders that are trying to motivate people around really hard issues? So I have a couple of organizations listed here on the slide before I give you some, some sciency tips here. These are three organizations that I admire a great deal that have done a lot of important work in social equity and justice here in the United States. And all of them are dealing with issues that are really difficult, complex, and traumatic. And all of them have turned to comedy. Now, I think that's saying something, right? So on the top, we have the issue of basic human rights protections for domestic workers, largely immigrant women in the United States who generally don't have the, as many rights and protections legally and otherwise. This organization, the Domestic Workers Alliance and Caring Across Generations, two organizations that work together, they use comedy to actually work with the amazing women that they work with to actually help them to tell their stories effectively for advocacy purposes. The group in the middle is Everytown for Gun Safety, which deals with gun violence, mass murder in the United States because of our gun laws, and basically has turned to comedy occasionally to talk about the absurdity of gun laws in the United States. And the one on the bottom is a group called Define American that deals with immigrant rights issues and immigration related issues in the United States and they use comedy for the same reasons. So why do we use comedy culturally when we're dealing with really tough complex issues and fighting for equity and justice? Here are a couple of reasons that come out from many, I've done many, many interviews for all these books and the studies that I've produced and this is what people generally say over and over again. Why do you turn to comedy when your issue is sad and hard and complex and traumatic? Well, a couple of reasons. Comedy can humorize, humanize those who have been othered in the mainstay of media uh, portrayals, right? People who are portrayed either as voiceless or with no agency, or we don't see them hardly at all. Comedy invites people in. Comedy can also mobilize a base of activists and social justice rights people who are exhausted by the doom and gloom of their issue. We have to find ways to keep people energized to fight for democracy and human rights and uh, social progress. Comedy attracts new supporters, right? So if we see something funny, we're more likely to share it. We're more likely to have it sort of become part of our identities. That's another way that comedy is meaningful and the need for optimism. We need optimism in movements for social change and progress. And there's a reason why across cultures, across histories, we find comedy in the most oppressive conditions over and over and over again, because we need comedy in that way. So I'm gonna go ahead and stop my screen share now. That is just a little bit of information to get you all kind of thinking about this and perhaps thinking about some big juicy questions that you might wanna ask any of us, but particularly Lola and Ricardo when we hand it over to them. So thank you all for giving me that time. And now it is my great honor to reintroduce my friend and colleague, Ricardo Da Buffalo to tell us some smart things about his experience in comedy and journalism and music and all the things. Thank you, thank you very much, Katie. And it was amazing, that presentation. I learned so much about my job that I, it feels great. Now I feel better. I feel like I'm doing change in the world. I'm going to uh, introduce, I'm going to present these slides. Let me just put here to reproduce, okay. So I'm going to talk to you a little bit about my work and my experience, but first, I want you to write in the chat, please, where, where are you from? In which country are you right now? 
please let me know just to to be aware of where are you in, in, in what may your New York City, Scotland, Germany, Bangladesh, wow, Boston, Oakland, Seattle, France, Montana, Cape Town. This is this is amazing. This is the most, I feel like I, I'm in the UN. I feel super important. Oregon, Portland, Brooklyn. I love this. Hi everyone. Nice, nice to meet you. I'm, I'm, I'm very, I'm very happy to be here. Serbia, amazing. Okay, I'm going to then share a little bit about my work and my experience with humor and activism. So I'm a comedian uh, based in Venezuela. I live in Caracas. Uh, I've been, I have 30 years old. I have uh, 10 years of experience doing stand-up comedy and I have uh, eight years of experience writing for uh, TV, online TV shows, because TV is censored in Venezuela, like for comedy, is completely censored for free comedy. Um, I write also podcasts, I write uh, web shows, all related to comedy and, of course, humor, sketches, um, the, the, the Jon Stewart version of the Daily Show version of Venezuela, we did it with famous comedian, Professor Briseño. I was one of the scriptwriters. I also teach at the first diploma, diploma of, of stand-up comedy uh, that is uh, yeah, recognized by a university. I also sing out of tune, but for comedy, it works. I do, what do I do related to human rights activism? I do stand-up comedy. I do it about daylight, day situations, uh, the regular stuff that we live. So that's, it's, it's not about activism. It's just about getting the hardest laugh as possible, but getting to the end of the show, I usually start uh, putting the political and, and more activism uh, message of my work, which is we need a free country, we need democracy, the problem is the oppression, the dictatorship, and so on. So, but I usually just get the audience in love and, and exhausted with laughter. And then I'll just put on the message when, when they love me, I'll tell them, okay, this is an important thing to address. So that has worked for me because politics in my country is really, people are very, um, not connecting to politics right now. So in, in order to make people connect with this kind of message and with this kind of attitude of we need to change, I need, to, I need them to win their hearts first. So that's an important thing to, to know. I've also done stand-up comedy with human rights workshops. That is something that, that I can uh, recommend you to do in your own um, field. I, I assume most of you are related to human rights activism the way we did it is like we have we had a, we were in the stage two comedians and one lawyer and and we did shows for uh, universities and the lawyer was explaining about the human rights of that we are that we should know no it, it was a workshop about just you have these human rights the right to help the right to live the right to not be discriminated and so on and the comedians would jump onto the, the, the speech, so to say, and do bits and jokes about what the lawyer had just said, had just taught them. So it was kind of a translation. We were the translators from the serious part to the comedy part. And that was a cool way to maintain the young audiences from universities engaged in the, in the workshop and it was a cool way to have a lot of people come to the workshops. So that was a cool uh, way. It, it's like giving the medicine, but with a sweet taste. That's how we did it. I also do satiric songs or comedy songs. And we, I, I joke about what's going on. I, I joke about with the lack of power, power outages. I joke about criminality, violence, being victims 
of everything that we are in, in Venezuela, um, the lack of gasoline, the lack of water, the lack of uh, electricity, and so on and so on. But I also address the responsibility to the responsibles, which is the government. So at the end, we joke about our situation, we joke about our economic crisis and so on. In Venezuela, we have a hyperinflation, the second largest hyperinflation in the history of the world. For the na last nine years, the hyperinflation sums up to about 800 billion percent, which is, uh, it's, it's, we have taken 14 zeros out of our coin for the valuation for the last seven years, eight years, perhaps. So it's a, it's a hostile environment. So that's why the, the economy got uh, dollarized. Uh, we use the dollar, the American dollar now. So we have to joke about that. We, we cannot talk serious about that because who is going to imagine what 800 billion percent is or looks like? Nobody knows how many zeros there are. So we have to joke about it to understand how bad it is. I also do web shows. I do entertainment videos. I think it's a cool way to reach Gen Z and pandemials, which is everyone that's young in this pandemic. And I think the, the teaching about serious stuff with humor, as Katie said, it's a cool way to make people engage. I, I've actually heard that some schools in Caracas have shown these YouTube videos to their students to help them understand better the history of oil, for example. This clip is from the history of oil in Venezuela, which is very, very important. We have the largest reserve of oil reserve in the country, in the world. We have oil for like 300 years to go. And it's a big problem in Venezuela. So I explained the situation between uh, the, the society and the government and the state uh, regarding oil. And I think is it's a very cool way to make the young audiences engage. I also do podcasts. I do what I, what I think that is cool for activism is that I have live conversations with human rights leader, that there is Linda Loaiza, which is the first um, person to have the International Court of Human Rights from the um, OAI in, in English is the American um, organization like the UN, but for the Americas, I don't remember the, the name in English, but she made that court um, find guilty to the Venezuelan state for a case of sexual violence against her. So she's a big human rights leader. I interviewed her about her new book and she was smiling, she was a light. Uh, otherwise she couldn't get to an audience that's young or that doesn't know anything about her case because it was like 20 years ago, her case. And my audience is usually between eight, 18 years old and 35 year old. So to make an interview with her and talk about her book and her story in a light way, even though it's a really hard and difficult subject, it's a cool way for people to understand her feelings about stuff and her, her work. I also do screenwriting and we have done screenwriting with journalists. This is a, a video we did with Monitor de Victimas, which is a victim monitor and they make a, a, investigations and reports about criminality in Venezuela, about the police forces murdering people who think they are criminals, but they actually murder anyone who is on a big list from criminals to uh, students that were doing uh, protests in 2014 and 2017. So it's a very serious situation. And we did videos to make people understand what this is, what, what story this is the, about the police forces killing innocent people. So we did it telling stories about one of the person, one of the victims that is one in 5,000, but we tell the story of one and that way we tell the story of 5,000. 
So I would tell you, instead of giving you giving the audience da data, like the, the police forces have killed over 5,000 people. You need to tell them the story, make them em empathize, and then tell them the data. I also do comedy sketches, which are like short documentaries of three minutes, informative videos. And I tell, talk about hard situations. For example, this is a comedy sketch about the lack of water in Caracas. We, I usually in my home don't have any water for like five days a week. I only have two days where I have regular water 24 hours a day. The, the other days I just have to have water in, in, in cups, in, in a tank. So I talked about why this happens with, with comedy. So it's a cool way to make young people understand and everyone understand why this is happening. I also do memes from an account that we, we have that is like The Onion, it's satiric news. And we do memes and satiric news. This is a meme that we tweeted that from an account that had 300 followers and look at the numbers was 4,300 4, likes because the meme is funny and it talks about really hard situation. It says right here, what truly happens in Apure, Apure is a, is a Southern state in Venezuela where the gorilla is. And the Venezuelan guy says, they don't know the gorilla controls Apure and the other countries from South America says, we do know. And the UN says, it, we don't care. So that's the meme. It's funny and it talks about it a real uh, situation that's going on and that no one cares and that everyone knows and that is something to be, we're addressing a, a problem that needs to be addressed. The other meme is about, let's see who is behind this, the Scooby-Doo meme. And it says this website is not available and who's behind it? Conatel, which is the organism that blocks the, uh, TV stations and, 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 and websites, journalist websites and stuff. I'm not, I'm, I'm not reading the messages. So I just want to know how much time do I have? Let me, if Mar Miriam can tell me, please. That's three I'll minutes, read. Ricardo. Okay, great. I'm, I'm getting to the end. So I have, sorry. We also do satiric news. The real news is that almost every country is asking Venezuela for visa. And our take was McDonald's playground to start asking Venezuelan children for visas. The real news is that there are constant blackouts in the, in the hospitals in the country. It's affecting hospitals. And our take is doctors to perform surgery to avoid risking patients' lives in a power outage. And the last one I promise is the Ukrainian president does the Anita challenge to try and get someone's attention. <laughs> so we do this kind of uh, news to make people engage with information. Uh, so what we have learned that may help you, humor engages with audiences, as Katie said, it makes people connect with you, not only uh, in person in a, in a live show, but also in social media, we need to give our message to everyone uh, to as much people as possible. So if something uh, makes someone laugh in social media, they'll share it to someone, they'll comment, they'll like it. So that it's an, an opportunity for you to have a conversation with that person to tell them, okay, you like this content, please share it or please subscribe to our newsletter or stay here with us and follow us and stuff. So it's a cool way to engage with an audience. And what I have I learned? Don't try to be funny if you're not. If you're an activist and your job is to do activism, don't try to be funny. Hire someone who, who is partnered with comedians. You, you probably have comedians in your cities that care about these subjects. So find them go to the bars if, where they do, where they perform stand-up comedy, reach out to them and tell them, do you want to do something together, a campaign, a video, 
maybe a stand-up comedy joke, whatever, and try to engage and give them your message and let them spread the message through comedy. Uh, serious doesn't mean boring. If you are talking about serious subjects, you can do it in an entertaining way. So you can make funny and engaging content. And I would recommend to look for a talented community manager that knows the trends of TikTok and stuff, up and stuff but you can do it very entertaining. And also tell emotional stories because emotion is key to help people understand your message to empathize and reach people's hearts. People are more likely to get involved when they feel, not only when they think. So if you get to people's hearts, if you don't only make them laugh, but also make them say, wow, this story is amazing. I want to help. So that's it. that is a way to make people connect. So that's it for me. And if you have any questions, you can contact me or at the end of this Zoom, we'll talk. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ricardo. And I'll just remind everyone, hold on, hold on. Remember your questions, also put them in the chat. There's a moderator on the center's end that's sort of curating them, but I was pleased that Ricardo mentioned one of the things that I say a lot. I'll just emphasize it. This idea of, I, I say it, Ricardo's probably heard me say this. I say what we shouldn't be doing is making what I call conference room comedy, which is like, if you have a funny colleague like me, I'm a funny professor, but I'm not a comedy writer. Like you should not hire me to write jokes. So the conference room comedy is what I call it when you sort of sit around the conference room table and someone says, maybe we should try to be funny with our 10 messages this time. And someone says, well, Joe at the end of the table, he's pretty funny. He should write the jokes. But if Joe's not a professional comedy writer, don't have Joe write the jokes. And Ricardo's totally right. They at Second City, they call this practicing comedy without a license because comedy, like anything else, humor is in all of us. So I think that we like to all think that we could get up and do a five minute stand up set. But being really good at comedy, right? Ricardo takes a lot of practice, a lot of bombing, a lot of figuring out your voice and all of that. But there's so many comedians who are sort of available. Yeah, conference room comedy, meaning uh, bad dad jokes or mansplaining. That's anyway, that's how, I, that's how I make it into a joke. Thank you so much, Ricardo. So I know you all will have questions for Ricardo. I have questions too that I'm holding until we hear from Lola. So I'm gonna hand it over to our colleague, Lola, who is gonna give us a little presentation and then we'll do a yeah. little bit more of a, a sort of group conversation with all of us. Yeah. Lola. Lola and her her pet. If, if my dog allows it, you know, I'm actually in my office working. But we are pet, pet friendly, you know, environment. So there she is, my dog Strelka. <laughs> yeah. Hi, everybody. So yeah. So you have heard I come from Belgrade, which is the capital of Serbia, and yes, it's being geographically located in uh, Central Eastern Europe. It depends on at the time, you know. You well, we're having a little trouble with your audio. I feel oh. like, I think the solution might be for you to not move your body. I, I am not a tech wizard, but let's see. Okay, so, yes. uh, how about now? Great, Whoa. yes, yes. Okay. Yes, so no one the, wants the, me the, as her IT person. Okay, so the, the robot position and the robot voice, you know, will do the trick. Okay. okay. And I do talk a lot, but, you know, let's see, you know, if I can shorten it for you guys. I could refer to a lot of things that uh, Ricardo said earlier, but, you know, let me, let me start first with why I have been invited here, which is, I have a friend, you know, that is a Portuguese living in Sweden. And we, you know, although, you know, there is a really big age gap, you know, between our generations, we actually share the same sense of humor. And we are cultural workers, so we are not funny as Ricardo or the academic kids. So, but we're going like, okay, you know, so we are so bored with our cultural management and writing projects and so on, you know, so shall we do something that is really working for us, you know, sharing the humor and so on? And, you know, actually, you know, that's where the idea of writing the 
borderline offensive project in our heads and we wrote, wrote it down and there the project that is called borderline offensive laughing in the face of fear emerged not to mention that that was just in the midst of the crisis so whatever crisis that might be you know in my country it was a migrant country and on the european level it was also the migrant country so a lot of people were actually fleeing you know from the from the interventions from the countries that they were fleeing in but let's not go there at this moment Okay, so but the turmoils and crisis are the new normal nowadays and the permanent state of affairs. So when somebody says crisis, I always go like, yeah, right, that's nothing new on the horizon, actually. So we are living the crisis all the time. But although, let's say that complexity and uncertainty and movement and change and urge an immediate future in which lives and ideas of people are bound to extreme violence in different forms, but brought by nature and society. In our society, the problem I see it is that money flow replaces the flow of ideas. And the ideas are actually the barriers of a social change. So contemporary Europe traditions a vision of peace and progress and uh, stability. Yeah, they like the world stability. But reality makes its basis predicament. How does it define and redefine itself, Europe, that is, its identity and its future uh, in the global stage? So that is not a laughing matter. How can humanity and art contradict this predicament? Uh, redefining Europe, new and old Europeans you know, took the difference, uncertainty and change and shared substance of European community and its future. And we just shared friendly remarks, being creative and ridiculous in dealing with our fears and the problems that came from that. Humor is liberating and the crisis in Europe is actually reflected in relation to the other. And I'm putting the air quotes there just to underline my notes. So uh, with this project, you know, to argue such grave matters, we propose humor as an artistic, cultural, and social source to challenge whatever, taboos, mutual stereotypes arising from the contact between different global communities, let's say, let's geographically put them, you know, in the Middle East and Europe. To rethink, actually, the concepts of Europe, European Union, uh, and how Europe sees itself, asking the questions and seeking the answers, you know, together with this kind of newly arrived communities, non-European outsiders that were perceived by the majority of the European communities. So humor represents the break of the state of the fair, a portrait of an period, epoch, description of reality but also humor recreates the communality. In description of the project itself, let's say that uh, borderline offensive is a form of platform, a transnational community gathering of farmers, local and migrant communities, cultural workers, academics in one place. I want to explore how art and humor can contribute to improving lives in society in Europe and beyond. As such a platform, Borderline Offensive has organized, staged, and produced different forms of tools aiming to provide the answer to the key questions, which are how do humor and art promote dialogue and reflection about migration, fear, pain, identity, social crisis? Also, how do arts and culture influence integration positively? And how does integration work to diversify audiences and artistic discourse? To be honest, you know, with your audiences, that was more or less something being this at the program uh, applying for. So, they, you know, the Europeans really are keen into attracting audiences into cultural events. Nevertheless, you know, move on. Uh, how do populism, xenophobia, and global cultural conflict impact? culture and freedom 
of expression, of course, and the mobility of creators. So the methods of the artistic, artistic creation art residencies that we organized during the project were analyzed. Uh, when each individual actually was immersed in the process of dialogue creation and observation. Now I'm not going to even refer to the EU integration policy because that would be really boring, but we can discuss that later. You know, how is this year it was actually making the division between the migrants that are fleeing from the war and in that sense, not being able to go back to the countries that have been colonized in cultural and military senses by the same person that made them flee and also by the economic migrants that were going for better lives, you know, for some decent money and so on, that were actually excluded from the list that were accepted by the European Union. But as I said, let us not now. So borderline offensive posted five offensive and uh, transdisciplinary artistic residences in 2018. Look, look far away now. Sorry, yeah. I was muted. I think, okay, so this is a Katie playing IT person, which should never really happen. I think if you stay right in the center like this. Yeah, I'm, I'm just a vivid person. You know, I can't just move, but I can, I will do my best. Thank you, Katie. And sorry, everybody, you know, because my body is talking as well to the, to the things that I care for. Okay, so let's go back to the five artistic residencies we have organized in five different countries, hosting 19 artists from nine countries, such as Lebanon, Syria, Slovakia, Yemen, Sweden, did I say Slovakia, Bulgaria, of course, Serbia, Palestine. And that was really exciting. And that was really so much fun, you know, as would, you know, you know, I hope that you're familiar with the Calvin and Hobbes cartoon. So it's if I if it's not fun, you know, it's really not work. So for me, for Tiago, my partner in crime in writing this project, that was it. So we were having like a blast, you know, actually doing our job, implementing the project that we wrote. So it was really fun. But to, to, to shorten the emotional outburst here, so we have produced four original borderline offensive artistic projects that have been selected for production and touring across Europe and Middle East in 2019 and 2020. Music of Real History, Ikean and Yemen Artists, which is a mixed media exhibition and lecture that lecture performers kind of presenting the ridiculous conspiracy theories. I don't know why Trump just came to my mind. I don't know. That must be something, some bleach, right? Theories by racist and populist as if they were the absolute insult to the society's collective intelligence is a quote from the one of the authors in the project. Yes, and you are included in that. Just a sec. Got it. Okay, so the, the Long Heavy Road is another project that's being produced by a Serbian artist, Darinka Podbitic, and Turkish artist that actually, you know, during to the situation where Turkey had to hide her identity because it was criticizing the position of the Turkish government at the time, and now it's even worse. So the project was actually creating a, a, a street newspaper for the uh, form of low five streets magazine, standstill, alternative e-publishing and so on, being created based on the stories that have been told by the migrant, uh, migrants participating in the workshop. It's kind of ironically sad, maybe just sad, maybe laugh not to cry, but still anecdotes that the, the, the members of the migrant community were willing to share with us during the residency. Another interesting thing that it's going more into the direction of the millennials was the gaming in the face of fear, which is a work uh, done by Salama Hassad and Isaac Rasvan Ermel, so, which is like Arabic and the Netherlands artistic work. 
which is a video game prototype co-designed and co-created to present the inter cultural process, let's say. It's a single or multiplayer game focusing on strategy, role play, social deduction. And uh, within the game, you will be asked to deconstruct stereotypes and make hard choices uh, when it comes to your position of uh, an unaccompanied minor, a smuggler, or a European migrant fleeing to the Middle East. So an, a nice variability of the options that you can choose for yourself. Okay, and so, and there is another a Bulgarian artwork, The Migrant in the Boat, which is worked by Petko Durman, a multimedia uh, uh, installation performance that paraphrases Jerome K. Jerome, comic classic, The Man in the Boat. And that was like uh, positioning yourself as a as a migrant in a dinghy in a dark world in a dark room, with only night vision devices uh, enabling you to communicate with outside. And uh, my my point, the last point is paper puppet poetry by Schart Collective. Schart actually means rejects, and that's a that's a collective that actually has workshops in Serbia, Slovakia, Bulgaria, and Sweden, collaborative uh, creation with the migrants and local community as well, with other fellow artists. Along the way, they work with the uh, uh, migrant children and youngsters, creating by crafting paper puppets that were transformed in the short video clip. This is the effective net woven from the tolerance, love, courage, persistence, passion, and humor that is at the same time captivating and addictive. And I'm finishing with this. Coming from the Middle East, one of the participants that is called Reza told a short story about his visit to one of the big cities' stories, stores. So the salesman approached him when uh, she saw him and said suspiciously, uh, I'm afraid this is too expensive for your pocket. And Reza just replied, I'm not afraid of uh, empty pockets, I'm afraid of empty heads. Uh, and to conclude, this story, among others, is where we use for the puppet poetry performances and videos, where the saleswoman actually is turned into Europe that says, I'm afraid this world is not good for you. That's it. I hope that we'll have more time to discuss details. Thank you, Lola. You know, what I especially appreciated about what you were sharing was how deeply communities are involved in shaping the work that, you know, in documentary work and community media, we talk about co-creation a lot. Sometimes we don't necessarily hear that when we think about comedy, but it's so important, especially when you're doing comedy about sort of trauma informed topics. So Thank you for that. Well, I'm going to start us with some questions. And I know that we have questions from the audience and I have them in front of me. And I'm going to start with a few because that I want to talk about. But, you know, one question I'd love to hear Ricardo and Lola both address this and I'll address it a little bit too. This is the number one question that comes up whenever I give a talk about comedy or I do something. There's always a question, always about, and, and, and forgive me, because I don't think this is ever intent, I don't think this is ever the intent of the question, but I call it like a fear of comedy question. There's usually a question that's like, oh, comedy goes too far, I don't know, it's offensive. And so I, I really enjoy addressing that, and I know that comedian friends do too, and one of the questions is, how do you make sure that comedy from one person is not offensive to another. And I, I'll just start my own sort of thoughts on that and then love to hear what you guys have to say, is that it's never comedy's job to totally make sure that everyone is not offended by it. Because if that's what we were doing in comedy, we might not ever make anything funny. I mean, part of what comedy is doing is being deviant and disruptive. Now that's not me excusing comedy that punches down that is you know many many uh, decades of misogynistic comedy in this country for example I'm not excusing that but one of my favorite answers to this question I, I think it has a lot to do with who is doing the comedy and for what purpose right if it is your lived experience and you're joking about a, a trauma or a, a community where you are from in my point of view you get to do your truth, right? So again, I do wanna hear what my colleagues have to say, but my favorite answer to this question, I was on a panel 
with a Native American comedian that we work with a lot named Adrienne Chalapa. She's very, very funny. You should all look her up. And someone asked this joke and she said, you know what? Native Americans were victims of genocide in the United States. So you know who gets to tell jokes about genocide of Native Americans? Me, not me, not me, Adrian, you all, for anyone who took that joke out of context. And I always thought that was the perfect way. She didn't have to get deeply theoretical and sort of get much deeper than that. But like Adrian gets to do the joke she wants to do about her uh, lived experience in her community's trauma. And I think obviously issues of power always are meaningful, but let me toss it over to my colleagues. When, when you think about whether you're, whether jokes and humor are offensive or how to mitigate against that, I mean, how, what are your thoughts on that? Okay, I think com good comedy is supposed to be uh on the line, you used to speak and, and, and dance on, on the, on like, it's like walking on a road, right? You're not supposed to be offensive because people is in a comedy show to laugh and to feel good and to have, to feel the, the pleasure. You're not supposed to offend people. Yeah. Probably someone will get offended. It's, it's very, it's very likely, but for, in order to do good comedy, we have to lose the fear of getting people offended. We have to try not to offend anyone. We have to really read our script. We have to really uh, have a, a, the, what we want to say, right? But for example, the Will Smith and Chris Rock incident at the Oscars is a good example. Mm. Probably Chris Rock didn't feel uh, like your, the example you gave, Adrian, uh, probably he's not the one to tell the joke. Probably Will Smith is the one to tell the joke. He can tell a joke about his wife or he can tell a joke about her trouble. And if she does, then probably she's dealing with her situation, with her disease and stuff. But if someone else do, uh, does it, you probably, it, it's, it's, it can be seen as disrespectful. So, my point of view is that we're not here to disrespect anyone. We have to be irreverent, of course. We don't have to bow to anyone. We don't, solemnity is the enemy number one of humor, oh. but we don't have to be disrespectful. I think that's, mm. that's kind of a, what I think about it. I think no less degree. Yeah, I appreciate that very much, Ricardo. And yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah, well, Ricardo is right because you know, uh, you, depending on the audiences of course you have to be prepared you know not to make stupid joy jokes you know like you know that would offend somebody you know because you are illiterate or not culturally aware in that sense but eventually you will offend somebody you know you, you are, you're a comedian Ricardo you know that that's, that's inevitable so you know at one hand you have to be aware of that on the other hand you have to not care like you know like Gervais does you know Okay, he is super offensive, but it's his style. When Tiago and I were talking about the borderline offensive, where the offensiveness lies, actually, so we concluded that actually offensiveness lies in the intention. So if your intention is to offend somebody, then it's visible. But if you're making a joke and obviously playing with stereotypes, you know, exaggerating, you know, going for grotesque or whatever, so using every form of humor then you know if you're not getting and you're just stupid and you don't, just don't go into now I sound like uh, really elite but no but you don't go in in a in a conversation about that so you know you either understand it or not so and you're not going to rewrite the script and I would really like to hear about the cancel culture that I hear a lot about those uh, those days no yeah. that would be interesting think, as well as a topic right Oh, sorry, Lola. Look, you took a breath and I thought I was, was going to talk. That's what happens. What do you all think, just since we're on this sort of train, what are some of the big misconceptions that you hear a lot about comedy? If you ever, you know, because you're both working in comedy a lot, what are things that you hear that you kind of think about misconceptions? That is not serious, that people are not going to take a joke serious that people are not going to take 
comedy is serious and it's not supposed to be taken serious. The, the subject that you talk about is the one that needs to be taken uh, serious because you can talk about racism in a way that's so funny that you laugh about it, but you know the message under underlined is you have to stop racism or, or these people is, is racist or the president is racist or whatever the message is. But the message is serious. The way you tell it is funny. So I think that's a cool uh, marriage to have in mind is that you, you can talk about serious, very serious subjects, but and really and really be funny. Yeah. And yeah, it's it's an art form. It's it takes time to get there, but it, it's worth the try. It's worth uh, making mistakes. It's worth the failure to get to that point when you could be really funny and really serious at the same time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, nothing to add there. I, I'm, as I said at the beginning, you know, I'm not actually in a in a in a comedy theater. I'm actually more in a human uh, <laughs> in a human rights defenders area. So arts, culture, and human rights. And I do like the media of humor to use it to send you know the messages mm -hmm. and you know when it's funny you know i think that the message is being heard better and also it leaves better traces in your subconsciousness somehow mm -hmm. you know so the, the 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 living in the world is getting grimmer and grimmer so mm -hmm. the only way actually you know to fight this kind of global crisis and then crisis again i'm being of that word but it's happening is actually to bring in something unexpected and that would be you know from my point a bit of humor but also naivety in yeah. some form yeah yeah you know just to get nerdy once again part of the reason part of the way that we laugh at a joke is because of, you just prompted this Lola the science of why we laugh when there's a joke is because of the incongruity. So I always say, this is why comedy and social justice actually are such an important synergistic power because social justice requires that we see a situation through different eyes, through a different lens, that we see the status quo and we think it's possible to bend it. To even make someone laugh, you have to find something absurd. The incongruity of the situation is where the actual laugh comes in. So this is sort of the ultimate answer to why comedy and social justice sort of live together. I, I want to ask, because it would be very irresponsible of me to, uh, to, to not ask this question. It's something that we think about a lot, is about risk and safety. So I think that, you know, in the United States, we take a lot of our, of our creative freedoms and our right to creative expression a little bit for granted. But those of us who study comedy, and maybe many of you on this Zoom conversation know, anecdotally or through your own work, that when countries are compromised by governments, they become oppressive, officially or otherwise, Journalists and comedians are usually the first threat when it comes to information. And so comedians are usually attacked in the same way that journalists are, and it becomes very unsafe to do that work. And I, I find it inspiring. And also in the work that we do at the center, we also make comedy for social change. I don't just write about it. We actually produce this work. And we think a lot about safety and the idea that there's nothing more threatening than a comedian making jokes in the face of dictatorship or authoritarian or semi-authoritarian regimes, because it's not only showing the sort of common sense of what's wrong, which is helpful for people, but it's also showing a kind of fearlessness, right? And the last thing that you want, if you are a, a sort of tough guy oppressor, is for someone to not be fearful. So I want to ask about risk and safety issues and how, A, what you think about that and to the extent that you can talk about it. And also how do you creatively work to mitigate if you're able to do that? And of course I want you to answer in ways that are safe for you too, so. 
<laughs> the safer way for Venezuelan is to say, we live in a democracy. Bye. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, it's, we have to struggle with, with fear and, and with, they have fined comedians for articles. They have uh, closed TV stations where a famous TV show, a comedy TV show like the SNL of Venezuela was, they shut the station off 15 years ago. And, and comedy, it, it was a very, it was a big thing in Venezuela in the media. And right now you cannot find a TV comedy show or a radio show that's really free to talk about what's going on. So the censorship is a big issue for not only journalists, but also to comedians. So you, you are uh, afraid of saying something that Conatel, remember the meme about Conatel, doesn't like and close your, your or, or block your web page or close your radio show if you are a comedian, because there are some comedy radio shows, but they're really self-censored. So you, you are afraid of that. But you find the way to say what you have to say, but not say it. Like if you say, okay, you're not supposed to sell something. Yeah. So you know what we're talking about is this and this and that. And, and the audience knows what the joke's about, but you're not saying that. So it's, it's a way to bypass the censorship, but also you have to deal with the fear to something if something happens to you. There was a case in Venezuela of two firemen that, were, that weren't even comedians. Two firemen that had uh, a donkey in the fire station. And they were giving the donkey, like they, they introduced the donkey to the, to the fire station. And, that said, and they said in the video that it was a presidential visit. It was a very light joke, but they got in jail for two months for that joke, for that video. And the, the law was the, the law against hatred, which has up to 20 years of prison if you find uh, that, you, that, it, that you, have, you have said something that promotes hatred. And that was inter interpreted as hatred mm. against the president. And they got out of jail two months later but that was like a precedent for you're not going to tell jokes about the president or this happens to you. And for, for, for you to be like aware of 20 years of prison for hatred is more than the highest criminal um, felony, which is murder in first grade, I think. Like intentional murder has 18 years of prison, but saying the donkey, the president's a donkey, it's 20 years of prison. Mm -hmm. So they do all this stuff to make people fear and to make people, of course, not be fearless of the president, mm -hmm. but you still have to make jokes. And we have some safe, kind of safe spaces like bars where you perform stand-up comedy or theaters, but they have closed theaters. They use the IRS of Venezuela to, mm -hmm. to pursue comedians who are, openly against the government and stuff. So we, we have the censorship, we have, they impose fear, but we still have to do our jobs. We still have to make people uh, laugh and think, we just have to read the joke five times more in order to see, okay, I'm not committing any hatred or any felony, or it's not gonna be interpreted in any way. And we have to find creative ways out of it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I always think for, for any sort of human rights organizations or sectors that sort of still aren't taking comedy seriously, when you tell stories like that, it's like, well, leaders take comedy seriously enough to be afraid of it, right? So we know how potent comedy is when it comes to activating dissent and getting people to think in different ways. Lola, did you have anything to add? In the middle? I wanted to say that so uh, in Serbia, you know, you, if you offend the president, you just end up in the on the yellow pages, and you know your name being stigmatized, and they just you know find you, you know, 
let's say, making love with a donkey, but not really, you know, <laughs> having a problem with the naming a president, you know, as a, as a, a donkey. Well, the essence uh, of humor lies in resistance, you know, you just do it, you know, whatever, you know, it takes, and you're just risking it because you have this urge, you know, to do it. Of course, Freud is speaking, you know, from my body. That is saying, actually, stop making sense, see? Oh, uh, <laughs> that's the big reveal at the end. Yeah, so it's about all the embarrassment of the situation in which we find ourselves and from which we kind of get out to humor, but also art. And I'm just rooting for that. Yeah, agree. Well, so sort of probably the ultimate question that we should be asking in this particular gathering is, what tips do we have for people and organizations who want to use humor and comedy in their social justice humanitarian work? What are the tips? I, you all can interpret that any way that you'd like, either creative tips or strategic or however you'd like to think about that. Other than work with real comedians like Ricardo said. <laughs> uh, yeah, that's that's a cool tip. Also to be able to play with ideas. Creative creativity is about playing like we're kids. Even though we can talk about horrible situations, we need to play with what we feel about the situation or what we know or what happened. When the comedy goes out, it's important to punch up and not punch down. We don't need to punch down on the victims. We need to punch up to the oppressors. That's key to the comedy we're going to do in social, in social justice. So you probably need to find a comedian who does this already, who punches up and who does, who does a right, who's funny, and, and you can partner up with them. We partnered up with uh, Katie and the Center of activism and we did the comedy think tank with activists from Venezuela and comedians. We were, there were like eight activists from Venezuela and five comedians and they told us all this information in one day, we cried. And then the next day we <laughs> laughed about it. We, we make jokes and we wrote like 15 or 20 scripts and we recorded those scripts. And some of them are so hilarious and they talk about our troubles, our, our crisis. So it, it was a cool partnership. If you want to do that, for example, that's a cool partnership to do, activists with comedians and just be able to work in, in brainstorm ideas and play with everything that you uh, care about and the comedian cares about as well. And you're gonna get something good out of it. I think if you all are, honest, even though it, something can hurt you, that's a cool way to say, okay, that's the limit. Probably people is gonna be hurt for this joke too, so we don't say that joke, joke. but we can be able to, to explore ideas with comedians. I think that's a cool tip. Love that. Sure. Well, Lolo, you work with so many creative people. What would you add to that? Well, I would I will be really short and just say that jokes tend to uh, upset those without imagination. So <laughs> I uh, you know, love that. Let us let us hope that you know we can actually educate next generations to be able to keep their minds open, curious, and react positively with a great deal of naivety, solidarity and love for the world they are living in. I love that quote, Lola. I wanna make sure I get it right. Comedy tends to irritate people with no imagination. It's so good. Have you said that before? Or was this uh, brand new just now? Uh, it's true. It's very good. I think we're all gonna cite Lola for that one. I love that. Cause also that has, it goes exactly with what Ricardo said. I want to echo that. This, this idea in my the book that's coming out, I wrote a whole chapter on how the process of making comedy and how that in and of itself requires what I call creative deviance. 
And if you look at any kind of major element of social progress, great inventions over time, they all require the great innovative power of wide open creativity. And that is ultimately how comedy is created. So it has to be allowed to be free as it's being created in order to get to what the revelatory thought is. And so this piece about imagination is just awesome. I think we might be at the end, my friends. I feel like we got there. Miriam, are we? Miriam is the boss of us, so she- I think we have time for, to just address any of the two audience questions about organizations working in either gerrymandering or Kaneen's question, if we want to throw those into the room. Sure, yeah, let me add, that might be one where if P, I feel like there may be some of you have some of the answers to those questions because I tried to answer in the chat a little bit. Some of you actually had gerrymandering examples, so hopefully the transcript might be available. That is ripe for comedy. I mean, there is nothing more absurd than looking at those maps, right? I, I, I don't know actually about gerrymandering. We have, they have done it in Venezuela and actually we lost the the right to vote, we actually lost it. They, they kidnapped the power to, of elections. And we have that problem since like 2017, still hasn't been figured out. And people are not voting freely, so they don't come to vote because of that. Uh, but there is a, a way that we addressed it in our satiric page is that since there weren't free elections, we made a candidate out of a, a juca. Do you know that? The, 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 let me let me look for that. A yuca in English is is the same word, right? Yucca. You know the yucca. It's it's a it's a it's a plant. It's like a banana. It's it's like a potato. Oh. Uh huh. So we use that as a as a candidate for for the elections. Oh my God. And, and and yeah, and, and we did a jingle for the yuca, and, and we did it that, that it's gonna change everything because it's the only candidate that you can actually trust. It's, it's not gonna lie to you. <laughs> it's not gonna do anything to you. So we did that, and, and it was a way to show people that you cannot trust anything in the election system. So mm. you can always do something about inanimate objects or something like that. You can maybe, yeah, it's, it's you can find jokes about gerrymandering, of course. The, the cool thing is, about, is to address what people feel about the election system. If people feel that they don't trust it, you should address that in the joke and people are gonna engage in that and you're gonna create a conversation in your community, in your social media account and that's something good to address them into, okay, if you're unhappy about this, so come join to this conversation, come join to our live chat rooms and stuff. And it's a cool way to engage with them. Yeah, I love that. And, and Ricardo, I think it's perfectly appropriate to note that the final comment here has resulted in a chat about the similar fruits to the yucca. I don't know, is that a fruit? Is that a vegetable? Anyway, there's now a discussion about its starchy goodness and what other things are similar to it. So I think that's very appropriate for a, a conversation about comedy. We should end on the merits of the phallic shaped fruit slash vegetable that can make electoral politics funny. I'm gonna turn it back over to Steve to close us out, but Steve, thank you very much for having all of us. It's been really fun to chat with everybody. Yeah, glad to do it. And, you know, as we're wrapping up, I have like all kinds of other things I would love to talk about. Like one of the things I was hoping we could get into is how you can use a comic persona to uh -huh. say or become a villain or, or say things that are, you, you know, the sincerity comes across in the overall message as opposed to the words you're actually saying and things like that yeah. related to like talking about being offensive. It's like, you can actually be offensive if, if it's under the guise of a persona. Um, but anyway, there are all these, I mean, I, I've always considered comedy its own art form that has never been taken seriously enough. And I know, Katie, you have your books. I'm just wondering before we go, are there any other books that you would recommend that people could follow up on with this? I know, and, and yours is at the top. Yours is at the top. 
<laughs> I, I'm fine. Yeah, thank you. Well, yeah, there is another book out. Well, one of the original books, I know that Ricardo mentioned in our, not today, but he's mentioned our work together. I'm, I'm starting to look at my bookshelf because I literally have every book about comedy and sure, media. Sure. The sort of godfather of them is a book called Entertaining Politics by a scholar named Jeffrey Jones that really was a bit of a progenitor in, you know, it, it's hard to, for us to imagine this at the time, but when The Daily Show first came out and became really hot, sort of every political scientist were like, oh, we are not taking this seriously. And, you know, it, it just went on like that for a while. And his book came onto the scene and was like, you all are not looking at this properly. And so that's a book that a lot of us cite as kind of reframing the entire idea of contemporary comedy and public engagement and civic engagement. So that's a really good one. Entertaining Politics, there's two editions of it. And if you wanted, Steve, I could put together a tiny little reading list if people wanted like, to, like citations and things that would I'd be love it. Yeah. Not we have different. a reading list on the Center for Artistic Activism site oh. and there's some stuff under the comedy section. If I remember right, it's one of them is dead funny with humor in Hitler's Germany, which is about like comedy oh. during the Nazi period. And it's yeah. amazing. You know it's what? Especially for very nerdy. Ricardo and I, hold on, Ricardo. Oh, look, see, I have it right creative, here. It's so good. Uh, creative resistance is a very good one. Yep, that one. Great. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like I have tabs in it. You know, I'm obviously reading it. I have cited it. Yeah, Ricardo and I discussed that one. This is a great one. Well, maybe we can put something together and when we post the video of this, we'll have that with it. Um, yeah, that's a good idea. And I have some journal article citations that people might be interested in if you can access behind the great paywalls of academic publishing. Or maybe we can find I just got right tenure, so I can say things like that now. Yeah, <laughs> congratulations. <laughs> um, all right, so I wanna thank everybody. I saw some familiar names coming today. And people from as far as way as South Africa, and um, so always pleased to see the different faces, the familiar faces here. Yeah, we have that giveaway. So if you want to uh, tweet something or post something about this and help get the word out, we're going to pick somebody and send them a book. Of course, I want to thank the folks that make this possible, which is Andreas Soros Columbell and Open Society Foundations. And there's the details. So yeah, if you can tag us, we could, we'll know that it, you did it and that we can bring it out to you. And our next one, what is our next one, Miriam? There's, she's building up the suspense. Sorry, <laughs> we went crazy. Our next one is about the power of utopia and ah. will be at the end of April. So stay tuned for our newsletter about that. Mimi, I love your reaction. <laughs> Just went, yeah. yeah, so uh, Steve Duncombe, our other co-founder wrote a whole book about uh, translation of utopia and, and um, and if you're like, what do you mean? Uh, you should definitely come. <laughs> so thank you all for attending and we'll see you next time. And thank you, Ricardo and Katie and Lola. Really appreciate you taking the time. Thank you, it was fun.